beginning in the early 1820s, the temperance movement, a global campaign to limit alcohol consumption, grew across Canada, propelling the country into the era known as Prohibition, which lasted in part until 1948. Various temperance organizations in Canada, as well as a significant number of citizens and politicians, were increasingly contending that alcohol was a problem in Canada. At a time of little social welfare, poor water sanitation, and sometimes more taverns than streets, they argued that alcohol was a source of misery and moral decay, and an obstacle to economic and social success. In Yukon Territory, the Klondike Gold Rush of the 1890s had left the region with a large floating population and a high number of taverns and alcohol sales to match. Years after the gold rush ended, Dawson City's ratio of bars and saloons per capita was still 10 to 15 times the national average, and local temperance advocates rallied against the same conditions being highlighted across the country. Inappropriate and dangerous alcohol-induced behavior, domestic violence, health issues, low productivity, and more. Over several decades, the temperance movement grew, and in 1878, the Canada Temperance Act was passed. Although the federal government still controlled alcohol manufacturing, local governments now had the option to ban the sale of alcohol through popular vote. In 1901, Prince Edward Island became the first province to enact prohibition, and by the outbreak of the First World War, prohibition efforts reached their peak, championed as a patriotic wartime choice. Still, alcohol remained legal in some parts, until in 1918, through the War Measures Act, Ottawa imposed nationwide prohibition for the remainder of the war. It's important to note at this time across the country, Indigenous peoples were not included in either the conversation or the lawmaking resulting from the temperance movement. Back in the Yukon, the discontent around alcohol use had increased. In the first vote, the wets won the day by only three votes. It did not go unnoticed that if women, who strongly supported prohibition, had the right to vote on the issue, the outcome would have been in favor of the dries. The women of Dawson City quickly lobbied to change the Yukon's Election Act and succeeded. Two years post-war, the Yukon voted for prohibition. It did not go as planned. The high number of alcohol-dependent businesses left over from the gold rush, combined with a sharp decline in population and lack of resources from Ottawa, created a perfect storm for economic ruin. Barely a year after 40 votes brought prohibition in, a two-to-one vote sent it back out. At this time, the best and most common way to send goods to the territory was by rail via the White Pass and Yukon route, which traveled from BC through Alaska to the Yukon. However, the US was now undergoing its own prohibition era, and Alaska had been a dry state since 1918. In 1922, the US government placed an embargo on alcohol transportation, denying the newly wet Yukoners access to their alcohol. This included a stockpile of liquor, then worth $100,000, sitting in a warehouse in Vancouver. The years that followed involved several schemes to bypass the embargo, including reviving an old treaty allowing the alcohol to travel by sea and up the Yukon River, an attempt to categorize the alcohol as medicinal to allow it to travel through Alaska, and transportation via hydroplane. This last plan was particularly significant Airplanes were still relatively new, and there was still much debate about the laws of the sky. The United States would not formally assert sovereignty over their own airspace for another four years, and it was still unclear whether a Canadian plane flying over Alaska could carry alcohol. It was the opinion of American prohibition officials, reinforced by a parallel U.S. Supreme Court ruling, that American territory extended above land and that they were within their rights to impose their embargo upon the skies. The decision that prohibition extended into the skies was all over the news. It was considered an important step in developing international law. The decision galvanized conversations around air sovereignty and would help shape how Canada and other nations considered laws and responsibilities regarding air travel. After years of national and international negotiations at the provincial and federal levels, slowed by politics and bureaucracy, it was agreed that Canada would take certain measures to better monitor customs, including along the Detroit-Windsor Corridor, 
the source of 75% of the alcohol being smuggled into the U.S. during their prohibition, in exchange for permission to transport alcohol through Alaska to the Yukon. The Suppression of Smuggling Treaty came into force July 27, 1925, three years after the embargo began. Most provinces and territories repealed their prohibition laws in the 1920s. Prince Edward Island was the last to do so in 1948. The temperance movement and prohibition impacted many parts of Canadian life, such as women's suffrage and economic and social patterns. In the Yukon, the history of prohibition is one of social and political change, creative problem solving, and standing one's ground to drive national interest and international policies forward.